And welcome back to World Energy Week Live 2021. I'm John Defterius in London, taking the baton from Arthur Hanna and Edna Trainer. This is truly a global event. If you look at uh, where we're broadcasting from here in London, a little bit later from New York, uh, from Nur Sultan, the capital of Kazakhstan, St. Petersburg and Dubai. It's a fantastic session. Uh, what a month indeed in terms of the energy markets. And we see uh, North Sea Brent trading above $80 a barrel. Uh, over the last uh, year, we've seen gas prices uh, up six to seven times higher than they were before, a gas crisis that we're seeing in Europe in the midst of an energy transition and less than a month ahead of COP26. There's plenty to talk about here. Uh, I'll be joining us for uh, a later, a little bit uh, later on a plenary session uh, to look at humanizing energy. It's an incredible topic and something that's been a gap in the energy market. But let's introduce our next uh, panel. Uh, driven by the future leaders community of the World Energy Council itself. Uh, let me bring in uh, Tadis Anam Suma, the engineering manager of projects at Crota. He's going to be joining us from the Netherlands here, uh, looking at the future of this uh, globe that we're living in today, the challenges in the energy market, and, and also with the consumer in mind. What's the consumer's relationship to energy uh, with prices where they are today, but also uh, the challenge of the energy uh, transition as well? Tadis, it's over to you. Hey, thank you very much, John, uh, for the glowing introduction. And welcome to everyone uh, for World Energy Week Live under the theme of uh, Energy for Better Lives. I'm Thaddeus, Engineering Manager at Croda, a specialty chemicals company, and your host for this session. In the session, we're going to be talking about the customers of the future, what they may expect. Uh, what they might need, what it could mean for governments, operators, society as a whole. And our panelists are my fellow future energy leaders of the World Energy Council, and they're going to be bringing perspectives from around the globe, um, as well as from the different key sectors of finance, academia, technology, government, industry. So it's really a privilege uh, for me today to introduce you to Prashi Gupta, a consultant at NITI IOG, to Tenra Furi, energy researcher at Vienna University of Technology, Keshan Samara Singh, clean energy technology specialist at Asian Development Bank, and Matthias Trader, director of customer success at Cognite. And we're going to make this session really interactive, so uh, keep your questions coming in, and we will be uh, trying to address your questions with the panel as much as possible. But uh, to start things off, I've got a question which I'm going to address to everyone, the same question. And that is, could you tell us what you think the customer of the future will look like? And also uh, where your perspective is coming from. Prachi, can you kick things off? Sure. Thanks, Adis. So um, I think uh, the future customer, whether, whether it's an individual end user or, or an industrial customer or even the utilities, I think the customer of the future will be smart, digitally interconnected, conscious of you know, where the energy is coming from and how efficiently it is consumed. And I think the future customer would, would also be super conscious from you know, the economic viewpoint, what are the electricity bills, how much are they saving? So if, if, I, if I put it this way, uh, in my view, the four key characteristics would be uh, one with the growing use of the distributed renewable energy systems, the future customer would would no longer remain just a customer, but become electric energy producer, what we what we call as prosumers. And living off the grid will become mainstream. So prosumers would be able to generate, store, and and sell the energy to their neighbors at at cheaper rates, maybe than the providers. Then uh, peer to peer trading would become popular and you know, gone will be the traditional model of uh, centralized generation. And, and second, I think the future customers will, will have the option and flexibility 
to choose the electric supplier, which is you know what we have today. And uh, and third, I think uh, time of use tariffs would be the new normal, and even you know the retailers will be actively forecasting supply and demand using the digital tools and systems to to provide better customer services. And fourth, uh, if I you know if I if I talk about the industrial customers, they would have uh, shifted towards cleaner fuels. For example, you know refiners would have digitally transformed their businesses, invested in technologies such as green hydrogen, electrification of heating processes, et cetera. And so, yeah, I think that's that's more or less what the future customer would look like from, you know, whether it's an individual end user or an industrial customer. And, and my perspective, you know, comes from what I've experienced firsthand and witnessed the evolving needs of the customers, you know, while working in the industry and, and now on the policy front, um, interacting with multiple stakeholders in, in the sector and across geographies and, and as a customer myself. So, so yeah, I think, uh, I think it's, it's going to be an exciting future where, where customers will become energy experts. Yeah. Yeah. That new future of energy experts. Um, it's actually very interesting and exciting and maybe challenging. Um, Tatendra, would you like to add uh, on how you would be seeing this new future, these customers? Well, um, initially, uh, we have to look at where the industry is going. Um, I think the three, what I like to call the three mega trends, uh, or the three Ds, uh, which are which are prevailing within the energy sector, um, of course, decarbonization, decentralization, digitization, um, and those are coming with their own implications, and um, be it from the utility uh, business uh, and right through to the customer. I mean, when you look at the origin of the utility business, for example, we had what we often call the end, uh, energy users. And uh, these people were essentially at the end of the line, if you will, um, if, you, if you look at gas to power. And um, they were effectively using the kilowatt hours or cubic meters of gas and their tariffs and their rates had to pay for the entire system. Um, with this restructuring of the energy system, of the energy system progressively um, over time, uh, we are seeing a migration to end users being independent energy producers, um, and and that's ultimately putting the market into uncharted territories. And I think the customer of the future ultimately is a customer who is uh, looking for control. Uh, choice and transparency, and uh, that's control over um, their energy sources and um, choice coming from uh, where the energy choice uh, um, energy source is coming from, uh, how clean is their energy, and um, transparency as well, how clean is their energy, and um, being able to have a control and manage uh, the energy sources. So I think that's that's those are the mega trends. Uh, that I would say the customer of the future would be would be uh, looking for uh, control, choice, and transparency over the energy sources. Yeah, uh, I think that adds on quite nicely in terms of what uh, Prashi was already saying of uh, customers becoming energy experts, and now you're talking about the control, choice, and transparency that are going to be, and also the way the market's changing. Um, to get a different perspective from, from that, uh, we want to talk to uh, Mateus, who's uh, working with Cognite, because you know technology is being mentioned in here as well. Hello, everybody. So, indeed, my name is Mateus, and I come from the industrial software world. Uh, having worked uh, for quite some time in the energy industry, 10, 15 years, I've sort of seen firsthand different challenges that the companies are facing while uh, you know moving towards 2015 at zero goals. And at the same time, I spent quite some time uh, working with digital technologies and helping companies to implement these digital technologies to achieve uh, different business objectives. And uh, to your first question about you know profile of the customer of the future, I'd like to build a bit on what Prachi and Tatena have been talking about. And also look a bit more broadly about you know what other industries are doing, how they use tech and other uh, you know other technologies to just become better, and how the profile of the customer is shaping. So I think I would like to highlight uh, you know, two characteristics that I see in the profile that are shaping and quite present uh, outside energy, but also inside the energy sector. And first is about flexibility. Uh, a lot of people, especially young today, they are very they have very short attention span. They like to try and test new things, you know, experience stuff. 
and it's natural, you know, they interact with uh, Netflix, Spotify, they have this subscription basis that is quite uh, natural. Uh, in the energy world, it's not so common. You see maybe Tesla and Automotive giving you this one month of trial of engine performance that you can sort of test it for a month and then decide what do you do. But this kind of habit expectations about flexibility are more and more common to come. And the second uh, characteristic I would like to uh, highlight is the way of communication. Um, today, I'm in the process of changing my local electricity supplier, and it's, uh, to be honest, it's a quite painful process. You know, some emails get lost. I need to send stuff by post. While you know, today it's quite easy to communicate with anybody in the world. I can, you know, do business with people in Australia, talk to friends in, you know, South America, etc. So I think this kind of communication it's natural in our daily life, and we expect the same uh, treatment, the same experience when we interact with energy products uh, and all the stakeholders in the energy landscape. Yeah, so we're going to be holding um, the basically energy providers to a higher level now as uh, consumers, as customers, um, and technology is making that possible, as, as you've been saying. Keshan, coming from the Asian Development Bank, you know, finance is a key part of, of everything that goes around and makes the world go around. What's, what's your perspective? Thank you, Darius. Um, we would like to imagine future energy customers in uh, developing Asia and Pacific region. You know, as the region gradually recovers from COVID-19, the energy sector security has been clearly identified as a priority to provide reliable energy supply. Uh, with market recovery, the costs are gradually increasing. Uh, in a, in a, in a, in a future crisis uh, could result in limited access to fossil fuels or unaffordable fossil fuel prices for developing countries. So this means smart customers expect to adopt new clean technologies and latest ICT with strong cybersecurity surveillance to avoid security threats and reduce imported fuels. Similarly, uh, they would like to have renewable energy supplies coming from its own resources or shared through regional uh, electricity grids or hydrogen grids. So with the rapid economic development in, in this region, customers are increasingly uh, depending on energy supply. So if the decision makers will not have a solid plan to uh, develop a clean and sustainable energy sector in a, in a developing country, naturally energy supply gap will be filled by fossil fuels. So finally, I would like to mention that uh, in this, uh, uh, in all this, uh, private sector has a major role in filling the investment gap and uh, fulfill future customers' need. This role uh, involves not only in providing financial resources, but also in introducing innovative technologies and also business models. Uh, these will enable to develop sustainable solution to cr create a vibrant energy sector for uh, smart future customers in developing countries. Thank you. Over to you, Tadis. Yeah, I would just want to pick up on one thing that you were saying there at the end, which is kind of key. You know, there's a big role uh, for private sector in here as well um, in, in transforming and facilitating this this whole uh, energy transition. But uh, I'd like to ask Prachi, you know, from having worked in the sector and industry and, and governments, how do you see this um, interaction with the private sector and the government and any trends that you're already seeing in the roles and, and what's happening in, in, in the land of energy policy? Yeah, sure. I think, I think that's, that's very well put. So you know, in, in terms of the trends as, um, as I mean, as, as, a, as a customer probably, you know, and working in the policy domain. So I think one of the most common trends that can be seen across the governments in particular is, is the recognition that first, I mean, you know, the energy landscape is transforming at a rapid pace and, and it's, it's no longer about 
about ensuring equitable and just ensuring you know equitable and uh, reliable energy access but but it's also reduction in use of fossils and you know deployment of clean technologies so we were already seeing distributed renewables picking up hydrogen is, is the talk of the world and ccus energy storage batteries etc and, and they have become energy policy priorities for almost all the countries and uh, second, I would say, I mean, um, uh, the governments are increasingly providing an ecosystem for citizens to to engage in decision making of their energy use. Uh, so, so you know, even uh, as as you you know mentioned with the relationship of governments with the private players, I think I think governments are are have realized that you know collaborating with the private players is extremely important. For example, you know, in India, uh, we had standards and labeling program. I mean, it's it's one of the major thrust areas. So this program covers uh, star rating for 26 appliances from like you know ACs to LED lamps, which which provides the custom consumer. I mean, or the customer or the consumer and an informed choice about the energy saving and and thereby the cost saving potential of the, the marketed product. So I think that's that's one of the examples of you know a close interaction between the government and you know the private players uh, and the customer. And um, and third, I think I think the governments are acknowledging that digitalization, decentralization, and and consumer centricity are as Tatenda also mentioned are, are becoming critical to successful energy transition. So we have seen we are seeing you know rollout of smart meters, scaling technology startups in the sector, opening up the utility sector to private players. So for example in India, I mean you know there's this there's a move to privatize the distribution companies. So I think I think the governments have already begun to move towards towards a customer centric energy future with with people at the core. And, and I think the same holds true for uh, industry as well. I mean, we can see major the oil and gas companies transforming their business models and from providing energy as a product to, to delivering energy as a service. For, for example, um, I mean, uh, recently, I mean, Shell has awarded a contract to uh, design, operate, and uh, design and operate uh, three fully electric ferries in Singapore. I mean, which when operational will be the first fully electric uh, ferry services for Shell globally. Then, then utilities are taking a growing interest in uh, customer experience. They have their portals for interacting with customers, addressing reliability concerns. We are, we are seeing the rise in smart grids, as I mentioned. And so, yeah, I think, I think um, yeah, Energy 4.0 has already begun for the government and the industries. Yeah, and you're talking about this uh, new customer-centric focus um, and, and this kind of change that you're seeing. And I'd like to bring into Tender here to comment on, you know, business models, because he also commented on some trends that he saw earlier as well. So what are you seeing in changes in business models, Tender? Well, essentially, um, in terms of business models, I, I think, you know, we had the huge energy companies which had uh, large production volumes as part of their business models and um, will be, I think those those kind of companies will be a much more difficult situation as, as we progress um, because growing independent, uh, in, because of the growing independent uh, production and due to subsidies, uh, there'll be a lower price for energy. Um, and I think a lower price for energy um, becomes a problem when you have to, um, uh, when you have large production, um, uh, or when you have large production capabilities because you have to manage the risk. So uh, because of the large scale energy production is financed uh, on the long term, that creates a problem for, for those who are uh, uh, used to having a business model which is based on large production volumes. So uh, that means most of the large energy producers uh, will have to change their business models uh, and start to invest more and more into renewables and better uh, energy analytics tools, for example, AI. Um, and uh, that will ultimately help uh, manage the whole en new energy system. And uh, as well, try to uh, make sure that we maintain the grid system, which is quite vital. I think a good example of this is, is Startable. I think they are definitely pioneers in being a very traditional oil and gas company, and then uh, rebranding to Equinol, which is now focusing on offshore um, offshore wind uh, energy. And um, I think most 
most traditional oil and gas companies would have to look into that uh, and maybe leverage um, uh, digital tools uh, within their uh, apparatus to, to be able to create new business models. Uh, but ultimately, definitely uh, large production volumes, uh, I think that's going to be uh, a, a, a change. And uh, more so when we look into investing into renewables, I think companies have to do, really diversify uh, their offering. And um, I think definitely start oil for me and it's, it's um, uh, stance in changing over the business model and uh, the rebranding and everything made sense. And I think that's a good um, template for, for traditional oil and gas companies. Yeah, so we're already seeing examples of companies uh, rebranding and, and changing the business models. And, and we've got a global audience here. I'd like to think about uh, Keshan and what he sees in, in the developing countries um, and the challenges there and um, satisfying customer needs and expectations. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Thaddeus, for the great question. Like, we are thinking every day about challenging how we address those uh, needs and, you know, expectation because time to time, this is changing. So, you know, both uh, future customers and of course the present customers as well in developing countries, uh, uh, they expect to have a reliable high quality energy supply. Uh, of course, a uh, hundred percent safe energy system with zero health impact, uh, of course, also they are trying to have a minimum, do a minimum environmental impact. Uh, the energy supply should be more flexible and um, you know efficient, such as uh, underground in power distribution, smart metering, and other smart equipments. Uh, also, the you know future customers expect freedom to choose. Previously, Prachi mentioned, uh, she highlighted that choose their energy suppliers with innovative tariff plans and uh, billing mechanism, which will reflect real-time cost of supply. So uh, we have identified identify several key major challenges to uh, fulfill customers' needs. Uh, one of the main thing is high initial capital cost. So it is challenging to identify a priority customer category and uh, allocate initial capital from a limited financial resources in a developing country. Uh, second is to develop a cost recovery uh, business model. Uh, big, uh, it is a bit difficult to uh, provide a latest energy solution to fulfill different customer ex expectations as uh, any modernization is directly coupled with additional cost. So I think uh, customized and community-centric innovative business models are more attractive uh, in this region, such as renewable energy microgrids. Also, uh, I have seen uh, technology adaptation as a big challenge. Uh, future customers will accept innovative solution but uh, you know, it takes a little more time for the transition because of the um, different uh, perceptions, understanding, and um, user friendliness with a smart energy solution to satisfy their needs. So uh, we may have to uh, carefully look at those challenges and see how uh, to overcome them. Thank you. Over to you, Tadius. Yeah, in terms of technology adoption, that is really, you know, the hearts and minds of customers that were, were hitting here. And that's what essentially this whole conference is about, you know, humanizing energy, making it about the person. Um, and then like the challenges that you're talking about and, and, you know, high capital costs and cost recovery, uh, sometimes, you know, we can detach it, but just saying, you know, the biggest win is in the customized. And so I want to talk to Materius because, you know, his job is customer success. So uh, how do you make this success 
happen? What, um, and maybe you could just start off with one thing you could do um, and uh, anything that's been working for you or examples that you see to, you know, change their hearts and minds. Definitely. So it's uh, a lot of uh, good points that have been uh, said by the previous speakers. Like uh, Prachit, I noted the keyword uh, hydrogen and uh, Tatenda, I noted the word AI. And I wanted to look at these two technologies, you know, 10 years ago. Uh, they were only existing in the academia and maybe throughout some, you know, early adopters. You know, most of the organizations, companies, you know, they were not really active in that. And today, another keyword from Cash and I, I noted is innovation. Uh, and this is actually what underpins success in, uh, let's say, all of this programs about adopting new technologies. And I think we hear the word innovation, we think it's a cliche, it's a buzzword. It's, you know, we talked about it so many times. And I think we spent a lot of times talking about why and a bit less on how and what. And today we have so many technologies to talk about how we can, you know, bring these new technologies and take value from it. So we have all other industries, we have different, you know, business models or commercial models that we can look up to. We have these different uh, technologies that can, you know, just shape and make it better. So I think having this, uh, you know, skill set in house and specific, you know, engine around that the culture of bringing innovation and testing and probing different technologies, linking them to business objective, it's, it's this more or less the topics that, you know, all the companies and organizations are discussing and, you know, wondering what's best. And I think that, uh, you know, there are many ways to be successful here. And one that I would like to highlight is, uh, you know, you're thinking about uh, skill sets or the people you have, because when you look maybe like a life cycle of any team, uh, whether it's a you know company or organization uh, whatsoever, like you start small, you're like a startup, uh, you're very few, you're usually have people that are very generalist, you know, good at a few different things, but the key is to be a fast learner, to really understand where your product's fitting the market, how the customers are interacting with it, so that you can build something uh, successful, powerful and, eff and effective. And then once you become more established team, established company, you have very expert roles at certain positions. You have a bit more predictability on you know, what are your KPIs, objectives, so we are working towards that. But today with, uh, you know, hydrogen, AI, et cetera, are, you know, completely different place than they were uh, 10 years ago. There are plenty of other technologies. So this uh, mindset and skills are from the beginning, when you were smaller like this, you know, agility, flexibility, Having people that are great at, at fast learning, this is you know key to really succeed and really differentiate because you're facing a situation when you have you know so many topics and you need to you know decide am I do I want to be in a driver's seat on that technology on, on hydrogen or maybe I want to observe it and to, you need to be able to make this decision pretty fast uh, and also you need to have uh, methodologies to be able to test it fast so that you can maybe you know test a bit and see whether I am going for full scale adoption or you know what's my attention to it. Um, so that's the small as that, you know, the complexities that the companies are facing. And I think, you know, really innovation culture, skill set, fast turning approach are the key to really, you know, implement, uh, you know, great products and uh, make sure they are really running properly and uh, ensuring the customer needs because they will also evolve. Huh? It's, you know, we have certain needs we see today and uh, they will be different maybe in five, 10 years. So we need to also keep in mind on how they are changing in the, over time. Yeah, so it's really all about that agility and flexibility and the listening to understand what the customer needs are. Um, and But there is a push and a pull. So I want to ask Prachi, actually, what do you think the role should be in actually us, or governments, um, or from your point of view yourself, in trying to influence um the customer of the future. Yeah, I think I think the the biggest one of the biggest role that the governments can play is is you know empowering the customers. So so you know so the new year is digital customers. They they expect twenty four by seven quality power supply, low cost supply, access to green energy. And you know, as as earlier it was mentioned, they they want convenience and control and value added services. So I think, I think what the governments could probably do is one uh, to 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 incentivize uptake of cleaner technologies. Uh, you know, implement innovative financing mechanisms, and and enable competition and innovation, which will which will eventually drive down the prices and and result in, in new products and and services for the consumers. And I think uh, you know when we talk about the government empowering the customers. So I think I think secondly, the government should give consumers the the required information and support 
So, so for example, you know, develop consumer engagement blueprints. I, I read one of the countries, for example, Scotland had a, a consumer engage, engagement blueprint. And so with, you know, it should have countrywide, you know, awareness campaigns that can, that can probably enable them to make the consumers to make energy smart and cost effective choices. So, uh, you know, information kits, training to the community organizations and, and helping the customers understand benefits and savings. So it's basically, you know, creating that ecosystem of awareness and choices is something that the governments can do. And, uh, and I think uh, in, in addition, uh, probably, you know, thirdly, the, the policy frameworks adopted by the governments, they, they, should, they should have, you know, a systems approach with, with more fully integrated policies across sectors so that, so that it does not leave any of the players behind. I think that that's more or less probably you know what you know the three three key things that the governments could do in in influencing and uh, empowering the future customer. Yeah, absolutely, and uh, and empowering them through providing them with the information as well as providing them with the alternatives is essentially giving them that choice that you were and and it's been highlighted by several speakers has been asked for before. And um, one of the key things that's going to be playing around, and you know, we call it the energy trilemma within uh, World Energy Council. You've, you know, you've got this energy equity and you've got the, um, the security and then you've got the environmental friendliness and how those balance out against each other. And I think a big thing for the developing world is yeah, uh, can they even afford the energy and, and can they get it? Um, so um, maybe first uh, to tender, you know, you've got some perspectives on Europe and, 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 and Africa as well. What's, what is that looking like to you right now? And how do you think that's going to be uh, influencing for the customer of the future? Well, I think... Um when I look at, I mean, I've had the privilege of, of um, actually, I was born in, in Africa, Sub-Saharan Africa, and um, I then moved to Europe. So I've had the privilege of seeing both uh, ends of the spectrum, so to say. And I think um, there's, a, there's, a, there's a perception that um, price doesn't matter when, when you're looking at energy uh, within, within the developed world. I think recent um, market uh, disruption that we just experienced um, and um, the vol volatility of the market and how the implications on the price of the customer um, and how that is raising some concerns truly proves that that price does matter even uh, within the developed, uh, de 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 developed world. Uh, but looking at Africa, um, where, where I, I, I grew up, I think that the, I, the idea of affordability is quite crucial, of course, because if you're living under like $2 a day, uh, I think that that's a completely different environment. And um, whereas more within Europe, it's more um, customers with concerns where how clean is the energy, so they're more uh, uh, conscious with about the climate, so to say. Um, whereas in Africa, the issue right now is about energy access. We need to provide more energy. We uh, and, and and there's the argument which is made that a lot of people don't really mind what form of energy it is, um, which of course we cannot, you know, deprive them of um, the benefits which come with uh, with access to energy in terms of uh, industrial development, economic development, and human development. Um, but um, I, I think I think more so as well, making a contrast between the two, I think uh, affordability uh, to um, clean energy is just a crucial topic for both um, both uh, sides uh, that I, I've had privilege to be in be it, uh, as well. I think the focus is more in looking at uh, sustainable development goal number seven, which is affordable, affordable, having universal access to affordable and clean energy. And I think that is something which really resonates um, with both sides. Of course, um, 
Africa need, we need to make sure that we do everything um, to enable um, the, uh, the African region and as other developing regions to have access to uh, energy. But um, I think the issue of cost is relative, um, but I think there's a way uh, to find a common ground that we do have a facilitation to help the, 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 the developing world to have access to energy and uh, those who are developed transition to a cleaner source of energy. And um, that's, I think, from both sides, the issue of, uh, of cost is very, very, very much relevant and how we um, can make sure that we have incentives and we incentivize the market maybe through subsidies to make sure that there's a cushion for the consumer to not feel, of course, the heat because that affects um, general economy development. And uh, that's that's my perspective, having uh, stayed in, in uh, sub-Saharan Africa and uh, and now in Europe. Yeah, and and, and really, is, is the point is we shouldn't force the customers to have to choose. Um, we need to enable them to have empower them to have both the affordability and um, you, you know the app the, the, the access um, and so how do we make it clean where does the money come from is is the big innovation fit, uh, question um, and I think what we've all seen with COVID-19 is that when the world puts its mind to something innovation can make miracles happen what seemed like not before happened but you know there's a lot of the money needs to come from somewhere so keshan working in, in the asian development bank how do we get this money how do we uh, make innovation affordable is everyone able to afford it um what what are your thoughts on on how it's been working and how would you do it thank you thank you Tali. yes uh, you know <laughs> Affordability is a you know bold word word, uh, word in this uh, developing region, right? So as I mentioned earlier, energy customers uh, in developing countries are willing to pay for more uh, clean uh, energy and smart technologies. However, uh, it is important to improve their affordability for clean and uh, uh, efficient product. In the meantime, um, we 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 may have to uh, make sure the availability of low cost uh, renewables, coupled with uh, energy storage, uh, providing supply at a cost way below the conventional energy sources. So, uh, as you know, uh, lead time of energy projects is long in developing countries. Uh, it is important that policymakers and uh, developers carefully plan the infrastructure, uh, the infrastructure investment to uh, meet the needs of present customers without compromising the future energy, uh, future customers' needs. Also, the government could use there are limited resources to catalyze private sector to introduce innovative uh, solutions at a affordable price. Uh, that that's one of key thing. Also, um, international financial institution like now I am working as a consultant in ADB, and also uh, bilateral development partners could find uh, ways to bring in concessionary financing and uh, grants to supplement these investment needs. Indeed, this, uh, this will help to break early stage barriers in the market and uh, reduce the reduce unit prices of clean solutions, uh, clean technologies. Also, uh, especially to uh, we can grab more economic benefits from the from the uh, uh, latest energy solutions. Uh, 
I believe these factors will help to adopt new clean technologies in these developing countries soon. So thank you. Yeah, and that's one thing that we do actually forget that these new technologies, they may be more expensive in the early stages, but there are going to be economic benefits from doing this. This is the smart thing to do, um, not only the right thing to do, but it's the smart thing to do also financially um, to invest in the innovation. And what you said is basically we need global collaboration on this and, and private public sector collaboration, governments, companies, uh, in, international financial institutions. Um, so it calls for kind of unprecedented up until now further collaboration in this whole sector. Um, um, and uh, I'd like to, you know, uh, ask Mateus on his idea on collaboration, working more in the kind of consultancy area as well, um, but then at Cognite. Um, so what's your thoughts on um, global collaboration and how we can make collaboration happen and uh, maybe examples of collaborations that you've been doing from different sectors um, in, in, in your work. Definitely. So, and you know, linking a bit to what uh, Kashan and Natanda were saying, there are a couple of angles to, you know, affordability in the first place. On the one hand, you know, you want to see whether your product, whatever solution you want to adopt, whether it will you know, work, is it available, can I, you know, put trust in it and the second is about you know cost you know how much will it cost me at the end of the day uh, and then saying yes or no to to, to making the, the the final decision and uh, actually when i was listening to that and I, it struck me how much i admire sort of african people for their pragmatism in making these choices and especially on the you know adopting uh, you know financial uh, services because when you look at the you know financial industry in, in europe you know we have a centuries of experience of of uh, of this industry and uh, you know in africa they sort of look at the whole aspect very pragmatically they they, they sort of decided that, okay let's go full digital let's go to mobile payments and uh, delete the legacy system we don't need to build it like we can just collaborate together hone these new technologies and you know make every life uh, better thanks to that uh, and then on the topic of sort of collaboration and uh, you know how people approach different technologies uh, you know just think you know for all us panelists like look back at the early 2000s i mean we're all at some point in school, we were pondering about our future, which direction to go. And I, I sort of, you know, when myself, I was wondering, you know, shall I go into financial industry or energy? I mean, both were equally boring. In finance, you have, you know, these guys wearing suits, you know, turning, used to have, you know, wearing suits, uh, turning uh, papers, contracts all the time, talking a different language, not exciting at all. In energy, you had this, you know, dirty technologies. Um, you know, coal, gas, they were actually you know, century old technologies and, you know, neither of them seem appealing. But I think look at the sort of collaboration that happened there in the in the finance industry. Like today, they really went, you know, all of the large players, smaller players, they went to the adopting new technologies and all of the products you have for the customers, they they have somewhere like, you know, blockchain, crypto, uh, mobile payments, clouds, and all of these technologies are like widely adopted. And next to that, they built an you know, amazing uh, ecosystem of startups and cooperations between bigger players, smaller players. The governments are like really working closely to first understand it to be up to date because with new tech it's not enough actually to be up to date you need to be up to tomorrow so all of these stakeholders need to know more or less what's ahead to and on one hand put like legislation in place to create an environment for other people to do business uh you know to deliver products so that you know people can use it without any sort of uh, problems and you know legisl legislative uh, issues and I think this is quite impressive what they build there. And I think, you know, energy also improved a lot from this uh, early 2000s. It's, it's, you know, way more exciting today. Uh, but I think there's still a lot to, to improve on each sector, like on, sorry, on each of the stakeholders, like on governments to, you know, really be more understanding of what are the new technologies that people are testing and want to implement that so that it's easy for companies. I talked about innovation earlier. It should be very easy to try out different technologies without, you know, worrying that I have permits to try this and this. Uh, and have all of the support needed to execute and follow up on that. And then, you know, same goes for individuals and customers. We will want to benefit from both experiences, like from legacy players that have decades of experience in using certain technologies and, you know, knowing how industry works. But we also want to have the flexibility to enable these new players to enter the market 
and I'll have them uh, you know, having enough chances as, as the incumbents to really deliver stuff on the market and have everybody benefit at the end of the day. Yeah, I think to start off, you mentioned with the example of digital technology, we've seen that Africa can leapfrog in some technologies. And what you're saying, this mix of, you know, a lot of startups coming through, um, challenging the status quo, and then being able to benefit from the existing technology of companies that have years and years of experience with the, with at the same time with the fast moving pace of these startups it's uh, actually the ideal scenario um in terms of just back to you mateus uh, again in terms of uh other sectors that the in energy industry uh, can specifically or maybe even if you have specifically exa examples of companies that they could look up to and to you know the, in the same way that you know for digital technology africa made those steps just in general is there any other sectors that you think energy could look up to in, in this collaboration space and innovation space definitely so on the one hand i mentioned before you know financial fintech industry in terms of you know ecosystem uh, you know people working collaborative, collaboratively together uh, but there's another example that is more inside you know software or robotics world because you know Again, coming back to this early 20s, when you know, together with my colleagues, we were pondering about the future. Uh, I was actually inspired myself by American series uh, MacGyver. It was you know a story about like one guy that was you know great engineer. He could create stuff from nothing, and I went into studies and you know I learned all of these equations, uh, strength of materials, how you know machines behave. And after five years, I had you know a bit more understanding how things work. But I was not really close to become MacGyver. I was like, okay, what do I do now? And I think uh, there's a great storytelling happening in, in software uh, when you look at software products or robotics. And I think today, the uh, energy industry has all the tools available to start telling these compelling stories, like make this you know work attractive and uh, not just to, for new hires, but for any sort of suppliers, teams, organization you work with. You have robotics, uh, you have AR, uh, VR, you have all of these different stuff you can do with the data. It's really exciting to be in the energy industry these days. Uh, so I think a lot of companies are doing it, and there's definitely way more to go to, you know, be more familiar with these technologies and knowing how to turn them in, into value and embed in, you know, your products, your operations, so that you really can have, you know, fantastic story to tell that is attractive to basically everybody you are interacting with. That's my opinion. Is that way to go? Yeah, abs absolutely. It's, um, and you touched on one thing there, which I just want to take out, and that's inspiration. You know, and I think that's what we're calling for. And, and right now, the, for companies, individuals to be to be inspired, to to get involved in this energy transition. Um, I, I'd just like to actually uh, open up that question up to you know to speakers themselves. So, Prachi, what actually is is, is inspiring you um, uh, right now? On, Yeah, I mean, at the moment, probably you know, being being in the policy domain, I think, I think what's what's critical is is you know developing those innovative policy mechanisms and innovative policies that can actually benefit the entire industry, you know, across the value chain. So uh, there there are some models that that probably you know in terms of policy that have been adopted by the indian government which have which have been you know uh, which have been implemented in other countries as well so so for me uh, you know it's it's the challenge of the industry uh, which is which is turning into an opportunity you know we we have the we have the opportunity to meet the future needs sustainably so so what's inspiring more to me is developing those you know policy policy mechanisms drafting those policies which can actually impact the end user i think that's that's most inspiring to me at the moment yeah absolutely i can understand uh, where you're coming from, because actually, you know, my experience within Croda, yeah, climate is now a world recognized issue. They, Croda has said themselves, they want to make a massive uh, uh, amount of uh, emissions reductions uh, to, in, in line with science-based targets, keep it to 1.5 degrees, so energy transition. 
And that's a great opportunity, been a great opportunity for me to do all of these innovation projects, to, to think outside the box um, and to be part of the solution. Um, so, so, so yeah, absolutely being part of the solution is, is a, an inspiration. And to tender um, also to you, uh, what is inspiring uh, you right now? Well, for me, it's definitely how, um, you know, the industry was quite traditional in a sense, but um, everything is changing uh, and changing in a rapid pace. I mean, when I think about photovoltaics, I mean, just a decade ago, the cost alone were just staggering. Um, 10 years later, um, photovoltaics are pretty much cheap and um, uh, easily accessible to, to uh, the developing world. Like, um, that's a huge significance for me. Um, what excites me the most as well is, of course, um, the, the system has to change. But for me, I think there's a whole lot of pragmatism that needs to come uh, to how we can change the system, how we can actually decarbonize. So the, 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 the challenge of decarbonization is, is huge. Um, so we, we need to have a pragmatic approach to how we integrate the new energy systems that we have, uh, be renewable energy systems, into uh, 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 something which actually um, has uh, an impact to the whole world. Uh, and that's more a global um, issue because when we think about energy, we oftentimes um, don't really realize how it is so um, apparent in every part of our lives. And um, the, 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 the need to decarbonize just amplifies everything. So we need to give access to energy to a whole lot of uh, people who don't have, and uh, we need to do it in a sustainable manner. I think that's, that's a huge challenge. And I think uh, most people uh, within our generation are quite concerned about climate. Um, but of course, um, there's different uh, different um, ways one can go about it, but energy is at the central of uh, the discussion. I think if we can uh, manage to solve the energy part, the energy source part, I think um, you know other things will fall in place otherwise. So that's what excites me the most. That's why I'm actually in energy research. And um, that's very exciting time for me and uh, a lot of things that I'm actually getting to learn and, uh, I mean, for example, how we need to have a global a cooperation on a global level um, and how governments need to, you know, find solutions. That's as well something which is um, exciting for me within the industry. And I think um, young people who are really uh, thinking about getting into the energy industry should really, really think about that. And it's a good, uh, good choice right now because there's just so much happening. Yeah, there's a that that is it's an exciting time to be in the industry, and a lot of stuff is happening. And and you know you're saying you're excited by taking the ideas and bringing them pragmatically into real life impact, bringing them to air. Um, and Keshan, you know, yeah, just same question to you: what what's inspiring you right now? There are a lot, actually. There are a lot. Um, <laughs> many inspiring things, you know. First, uh, innovate your uh, digital tools, uh, you know, which will enable, uh, you know, us to meet needs uh, via new business models. Uh, otherwise, you know, we are still following uh, uh, ordinary uh, business models. Uh, this will help uh, us to uh, personalize our energy supply and, uh, you know, connect virtually. And uh, also, you know, in developing region, we are, uh, I, I have seen many people are generous. So at the same time in the energy sector, uh, we would love, like to uh, share our own excess power with other consumers like cash and good, cash or goods. So uh, uh, second, uh, I would like to highlight energy companies, uh, you know, could offer new services uh, such as a personalized customer portal which we don't have right now uh, this will you know uh, this uh, uh, portal 
can come up with uh, various offers like monthly bill reduction offers, as we mentioned earlier, and uh, also uh, introduction of uh, energy efficient products and uh, facilitating customers to invest uh, because I am willing to uh, invest such research and development because we need more investment for uh, R&D. Uh, so, uh, so also um, one of the key areas is uh, market can predict and support purchase most uh, uh, sought after energy equipments. Uh, these services, uh, you know, can be uh, coupled with information on customers uh, and carefully, you know, process with artificial, artificial intelligence. Also, um, uh, you know, I am uh, from uh, environmental sector, so I'm looking uh, for more circular approach whereby uh, they will, I mean, uh, uh, we, we will be excited to purchase 100% uh, re uh, re uh, recyclable equipments with uh, zero environmental and, you know, social impact. So finally, uh, I am looking forward to seeing uh, uh, the uh, governments in developing region and uh, private sectors active engagement in uh, introducing a zero carbon uh, emission society through uh, investment uh, such as uh, those connected to hydrogen and green electricity, uh, national law, uh, regional grids. So no, the, those are what I am waiting to see in the future. Thank you very much, Keshan. We've got one big last question from, from the audience and that is, um, do we think customers are going to be willing to accept uh, supply interruptions in order to have cheaper and greener energy? And uh, to tender, if you could uh, just take a quick take on this, both from uh, you know Europe and uh, also uh, Africa. And that will be our final question for today. Well, I think that's, that's a very quick answer. No, <laughs> but let me expand more to that one. Um, I think, you know, um, within Europe, um, it, what I've realized is these uh, people just accustomed to, you know, you hit your switch and you got to have your lights on, you um, put your phone on the charge, everything is fine. Um, but I think once, um, that changes that is going to be quite uh, uh, a lot of people who are not happy over that. So I think technologies ultimately have to um, make sure that we cover the emergency side um, of renewables. Uh, so I think storage is a huge part to play there. Um, so those who are working in storage guys, we need you to uh, be quite quick on that one. But uh, I think Ultimately, that's the way the industry is going to have to go. We have to decarbonize, uh, but we have to do it pragmatically and we need to make sure that there's a cushion uh, that the people don't um, end up um, in the worst cases. And also, I'm more worried about those who have um, less income to spend on energy. So okay. when I'm thinking about Sub-Saharan Sub Africa or the developing world, that's that's much more where my, more of my worry is. So we need to find a way um, to make sure that those uh, regions have access to clean technologies, and uh, we can bridge as well um, the uh, the exchange and in, um, in knowledge. Look what happened when Facebook was down yesterday, huh? And clearly the repercussions for intermittency and electricity are are higher. So. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, I think Facebook lost a lot of uh, value, I heard, um, in the share price it tanked um, for those hours it was down. I'd like to thank everybody um, for joining us today and a special thank you to, to our uh, speakers, um, Matos Trader, Keshan Samara Singh, Patenda Firi, Prashi Gupta. Um, it's, it's, been great having you here, the future energy leaders of the World Energy Council, and um, we've managed to discuss a lot of the customer of the future and share our perspectives. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you so much. Thank you.
Well, so we're back with uh, to do this now to kind of get a debrief of that last uh, uh, session. Uh, future energy leaders community gathering here, looking at the customers of the future or the consumers of the future. Tadis, there's a lot of interesting things that came out, but what I thought was at the start of the debate was the most fascinating that the customers of the future want to be at the center of it all. They expect to be able to have choice. They want more transparency when it comes to what they're buying, uh, how much it's truly renewable, what's the carbon footprint. Is that the major central theme of the next generation of consumers? Yes, absolutely. Um, so the next generation of consumers, they want control. Uh, that's what it's all about. They want to have those controls, those choices, but they need the information. Right now, they they just don't know, and in, in a lot of cases, they don't have any alternatives. Um, so uh, that's something that um, customers are going to start demanding, I think, from, from operators and from governments, that they do get more of these alternatives um, so that they can make their choice, whether that's pragmatically for the cheapest option or pragmatically also for the greenest option. Mm. Um, so he says that is, the, I think, the, 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 the key that was coming out of that. Um, yeah, and that was the main view, I think, consensus. And, and there's a lot of discussions about how exactly it's going to happen and which technology is going to take a lead and, and how much of a challenge uh, in the cost or in the innovation is going to be. But... Um, we need to get to that customer-centric focus. Good. Do we need, a, in a sense, uh, Tadus, a, a acid test? Because we have a reality gap right now. We know where the industry is trying to go to make the transition. And one would say we're kind of late to the challenge, right? The climate challenge that's out there. But then the expectations of the consumer of the future is, I want to do it now. Uh, from your vantage point and what you glean from the panel, how do we close that reality gap? That's a central theme. Uh, of the WEC this year. Yeah, and the thing that we need to do really to close this gap is really we need to start bringing, um, you know, the customers, the governments and, and, and everyone together because it's a collaboration essentially, you know, we're doing it together. And that's why we were talking actually uh, during the discussion about collaborations that we've seen happen in the digital world and, 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 and software and, and how also, you know, we can't imagine, we can't imagine where it's going. We couldn't imagine where we are now 20 years ago. Mm. And, and this is what we need to also bring uh, to the energy sector, this uh, kind of customer intimacy, get bringing the customer closer, but also this collaboration, this joint approach to um, uh, the energy transition. You talked about collaboration. I saw that uh, uh, Ms. Prachigupta from India was saying that they need to decentralize. And you know what it's like in the developing world. You have the major energy providers that have had a lock on the market. And now the consumer is saying, give me more choice. I want more value and I want more transparency. That's quite radical in, in, in the industry itself. Yeah, it's absolutely radical. And um, Prachi was talking about decentralizing. Um, other people were also saying that they expect more independent energy providers to be coming. Um, Mateus mentioned that the only way we're going to break through with the innovation is if we get the benefits from the legacy players and the new startups. So it's it's a radical challenge, but in some way, um, we need to make the best decision for our collective future. And this is where governments need to look at it in that way, just the same way they've done with the COVID vaccine. They've also decided to make the best decision for the collective future, and they've chosen innovation and, and, and ways to get the vaccine out there as quick as possible. And, and that's, I think, what's going to be the key theme when they're looking at the customers of the future and when they're looking at how they want to approach innovation in the energy sector. Uh, Matus from Cognite uh, brought up this idea of rebranding. And I've, you know, I've been in the energy sector for 30 years following it. It's quite extraordinary if you see uh, Equinor emerge from a stat oil, uh, BP being one of the IOCs that moved very quickly to be uh, moving into the diversification process. Total Energies in the last 12 months going through a rebranding 
uh, all the major companies are having to think about the entire energy value chain, if you will. But from your generation, from the future energy leaders, how do you see that? Is it greenwashing or is it the real deal? Well, there's a gap between ambition and action right now. And that's what is frustrating people. That's why Greta Thunberg was saying blah, blah, blah. Um, and right, we haven't done stuff in the past, um, but if we've got to look at the future now. So when they are rebranding and they're saying, we're now a green company, I believe that the customers of the future are now saying, we want to hold you to account. Going back to the first, they want information now. They want to be customer centric. They want the transparency and they want the choice. We want to know exactly if you're keeping to the promises that you've, you've made and, and those ambitions and those slogans um, that, you, that you're saying. So um, greenwashing is a part of life right now. Uh, you know, marketing, that's, is a, you're always selling the best version of yourself and it will always be like that. But the customers are holding people to account and what you're seeing with uh, companies like BP is they are making a major changes to become more sustainable. Um, and certainly they're putting the plans there. Um, and we just need to see the action. Okay, good. Uh, I'm going to wrap it up with one more question. I'd love to get your expectations of the dialogue we're having here during the, the Energy Week and connecting everybody around the world. What are the expectations in your generation of energy leaders, the next generation of leaders, about what we should see concretely out of COP26? Yeah, I think the concretely out of COP26, we want to see something more than a ambition for 2030 actually a lot of people say we want to see everyone around the world just make an ambition for 2030 that they want to be 50 percent reduce emissions or emissions in line with a science-based targets but we want to see more than that actually we want to see intermediate targets hmm. intermediate targets that are going to be what are you going to do in 2022 2024 2025 in order to get to that um 2030 and that's what governments need to be talking about with each other because frankly, what is being also put by to tender, some countries, they can't do it alone. Um, so they need this global collaboration to be able, uh, and they need meetings like COP26 to be able to all together um, come to these uh, actions. Okay, I, I could spend another half hour talking to you about COP26 and the expectations from your uh, generation, but nicely handled on the uh, debate. A lot came out of it in terms of where we're going. Uh, so you really uh, uh, illustrated uh, how the next generation of energy leaders are thinking uh, about the future. It's nice to have you. Thanks a lot for joining us. Thank you very much, John. Yeah, my pleasure. Have a great day. Yeah, thanks again. Uh, once again, Tadias uh, Anim Suma, uh, who is the um, engineering manager of projects at, at Crota based uh, in the Netherlands and a group that was covering Sri Lanka, Switzerland, India, uh, and Austria, looking at the customers of the future. And again, this is why we're covering it here during the World Energy Council's the Energy Week from all corners of the world, but to be very customer centric in the challenge that's ahead of us. In fact, in our next uh, plenary session, it's gonna be Energy for Humanity. Uh, this is linked to the World Energy Congress that's gonna be taking place in St. Petersburg next year. We're gonna be on the ground. We hope you are a as well, a phenomenally beautiful city. And our debate has a fantastic uh, all-star lineup. Bob Dudley, the former chief executive and chairman of BP. Maria Sooner uh, Fleming, the chief executive officer of the Swedish Association of Mines, Mineral and metal producers. Maria Vanderhoven, the former executive director of the International Energy Agency and a special advisor to the WEC, uh, and His Excellency, the Minister of Energy from the government of Chile, Juan Carlos Jobe. We'll be uh, joining you in about six minutes' time. And a, and a quick uh, reminder, if you'd like to join us on social media and actually send your questions to us, we're taking them on the platform. But um, for Twitter, it's at WE Council. That's WE Council and at LinkedIn at World Energy Council. And you can use the hashtags World Energy Week and uh, Human is in Energy. It is actually uh, a very important subject. Uh, human is in Energy uh, or humanizing energy is a better way to say it, right? I got it.
we're all there, humanizing energy. I was thinking breaking it down phonetically, but that was somewhat of a, a humorous joke. We'll be right back uh, in five minutes exactly. Thanks for watching.